It stood there too in the midst of their afflictions. While Joseph was alive, their lot was good. They flourished, they multiplied, and they grew. And that was God's purpose in bringing them into Egypt in the first place. So they could grow into a mighty nation, something they could never have done in the land of Canaan as they dwelt in tents as pilgrims and strangers. But then after that, another king arose in Egypt who made life very difficult for the children of Israel. And now it looked as if it were utterly impossible that they could ever leave the land of Egypt. And when they would doubt, they should look to the bowls of Joseph and say, Look, the bowls of Joseph are here as a lasting reminder to us that God will surely visit us. Why are the bones of Joseph among us unmarried? Because Joseph believed in the promise of God, and so should we. And if a child of Israel were to ask their parents, Mommy, Daddy, what's that box over there? Oh, that's a box with bones in it. It's a coffin. Why is it not being buried? Whose bones are in it? Well, son, daughter, those bones belong to Joseph. He was one of the fathers of our nation. And when he was dying, he said to us not to bury his bones, but to wait because one day our God is going to take us out of Egypt and bring us to the promised land. And when he does, we are going to take that box of bones with us and we're going to bury it in the promised land just as Joseph believed and just as God promised. And so as long as the bones of Joseph were in the midst of Israel, they were reminded of the promise of God. The reason for this commandment was the faith that Joseph had in the promise. By faith, Joseph. And Joseph's faith is remarkable if you think about the circumstances of his life. Faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. The question is, what Word of God had Joseph ever heard? He did not have the Holy Scriptures, because not one word of the Bible was written when Joseph was alive. Moses wrote the first books of the Bible. Therefore, Joseph had no written record of what God said. All he had then was the instruction which he received from his father as a young boy and the dreams which he received directly from God in his youth. And there's no indication in the rest of the Bible that God ever spoke directly to Joseph. He gave him dreams in his youth, but there's no indication that God ever spoke to him in a vision as he had done to Jacob or to Abraham. So all the instruction he had received about God, the true God, Jehovah God, came from Jacob. So Jacob must have told him who God is, must have told him about Abraham and Isaac, must have told him about the promise that God had given to the patriarchs, must have told him about the promised land, about the seed of the woman who was going to come, the promised Savior who would come through the, the line of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob, the one who would destroy the devil, and would give them the promised land as a picture of heaven to come. That's all that J Joseph had to go on. And remember, he was snatched away from his father when he was only 17 years old. He would not have finished his catechism instruction. In Egypt, he was surrounded by wicked idolaters who knew nothing of the true God. 
age 17, young and tender, until age 39. He was 30 when he stood before Pharaoh. Seven years of famine, 37, plus two more years, 39. Joseph was in contact with no other believer. Potiphar, Potiphar's wife, the jailer, the butler, the baker, Pharaoh, all of Pharaoh's servants, every last one of them was a pagan. There was no preaching in the land of Egypt. There was no church there. There were no Bible study groups he could join. No prayer meetings. No fellowship of any kind in Egypt for all those years. No one to give him encouragement. He was on his own. But the Bible says that God was with him. And many who have been in such circumstances would have lost all of the knowledge of God, would have forgotten completely about God, cut off from the church, cut off from the instruction of his family, you would expect that Joseph would have perished in unbelief. But by God's grace, the instruction which he received from Jacob as a youth remained with him his entire life. Notice what he says at various points during his trials in Egypt. To Potiphar's wife he said, How then can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? And he means there the true God, the living God, the God who forbids adultery. When he was in their prison in Egypt, he still trusted in God, even though his position was very bleak. And he said to his fellow prisoners, Do not interpretations belong to God? And before Pharaoh, he testifies, It is not in me. God shall give Pharaoh an answer of peace. And later, God hath showed Pharaoh what he is about to do. And now we have Joseph, aged 110, after a long life, most of which was spent in Egypt, surrounded by idolatry and idolaters, and he's dying. And his faith has not left him. <coughs> and there was no reason to believe at this point that Israel would ever leave Egypt, except, of course, the promise of God. Israel had never had it so good. They were living in the land of Goshen. They were the favorites of Pharaoh, flourishing and enjoying the prosperity of Egypt. It seemed as if God had forgotten his promise about Canaan and was content to leave them to enjoy life in Egypt. But Joseph knew otherwise. Joseph knew that Egypt would not be a permanent dwelling place for the people of God. God had promised that they would leave Egypt one day and go back to the land of Canaan. And when that happened, Joseph wanted to be part of it. And then soon, it would be impossible to leave Egypt even if they had wanted to. How could two million shepherds leave the mighty nation of Egypt. And how could they get to Canaan? And if they got there, how could they enter Canaan? How could they take over Canaan? Utterly impossible, it seemed. And when they were made slaves, that became even more impossible in the eyes of men. But Joseph said, God has promised I believe it will happen, even though it seems impossible. I don't know how God's going to do it, but God will certainly keep His promise. <coughs> and this really, which is mentioned in Hebrews 11, this really is the crime of His whole life of faith. When you read Hebrews 11, and you see what the Spirit has picked out in the life of the various people of God to mention 
Sometimes you're surprised. And you're surprised with Joseph. Think of the long and interesting life of Joseph. And this is what the Spirit chooses to mention. His dying moments making mention of the exodus and giving commandment concerning his bones. What about his great works in the house of Potiphar, refusing to lie with Potiphar's wife? Why is that not mentioned? What about his faith in the prison or his works in Pharaoh's court? Why are those things not mentioned? But those faithful exploits mentioned in the book of Genesis can only be seen in the light of the enduring promise of God. And the end of his life shows that this promise of God was alive in his heart throughout his entire life, even unto the end. Joseph believed in the promise of God. Joseph believed that God had a special plan for the people of Israel. He believed that God had a special plan for him in particular. That's why God gave him the dreams in his childhood, telling him that one day his brothers would bow down before him. This was not him showing off. That's what his brothers said. But rather, God was showing him a glimpse into the future. One day, Joseph would be lord over his brothers. But Joseph had no idea that that road to glory would involve being a slave, would involve being a prisoner in Pharaoh's dungeon. But Joseph had a very important place in the history of God's covenant. And God purified him, tested him, prepared him for that place through trial. And all of Joseph's faithfulness then was nothing automatic, but was the result of the work of God's grace, giving him faith throughout his entire life. Joseph was plunged into trial after trial, so his faith to be exercised, purified, and strengthened. Put it this way, a Joseph who had succumbed to the temptation of Pharaoh, of Potiphar's wife, a Joseph who was lured away from the promises of God by the prosperity of Egypt, a Joseph who forgot his Israelite roots and forsook his family, could never have made mention of the Exodus and gave commandment about the bones on his deathbed. Such a confession only happens after a long life of faith, a long life of believing in the promises of God. That's what we mean by when he died. The word means to finish, to complete, to bring to an end. Joseph's commandment concerning his bones is simply the completion the end, the finishing touch to a beautiful life of faith.